Hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel, The Art of Writing and Directing. I am Keiko, and I am joined by the very talented and creative team behind a new animated series. So before we really get into the discussion, why don't we give the listeners an introduction uh, about ourselves and what we do and what projects we're currently writing and directing, a synopsis, if you will. So uh, why don't we start with you guys? Okay. Uh, my name is Chloe. I'm the director of The Middle Ground, which is an animated web series about, it's, it's basically a modern take on Ragnarok with animals on an island, and they're all paranoid because they think it's the end of the world. It's just paranoia and paradise. Um, and then this is my friend Yogi. She can introduce herself. <laughs> Hi, I'm Yogi. I am a co-director for The Middle Ground, and I'm also a writer. Awesome. Well, I'm so excited to have you guys here. I can't wait to get into the discussion and talk about our views on writing and directing and how they apply to our current projects. For those who aren't familiar, uh, I am the owner of MLA Entertainment, and I do a lot of original web series there. My current one is Project Infinity. Let's see, I've been doing it for over 10 years, and so we do music videos, interviews, crafting how-tos, and in the near future animation. Just, just a wide variety uh, for everyone to enjoy, but uh, writing and directing are my passion for sure, and my web series are my main passion as well. Just to give you guys a loose idea of what it's like, it takes place in the future where the world has become one big country, uh, but then the bad guys took it over and made it into a place of communism and terrorism, all in the name of maintaining order, that kind of idea. And so the story follows a guy named Gun Lambton, and he's determined to kill the leader because he was responsible for Gun losing his mother. And so he ends up joining a team of rebels, and the series just follows them trying to fight back and trying to restore the earth. So that's a bit of a mouthful, but... <laughs> Now all of you listening know what kind of projects we're working on. And uh, now we're going to talk about how writing and directing shapes these projects. While we'll be dis specifically discussing creative, story-driven writing, the knowledge we're sharing can apply in many ways to all writing. You know, even podcasts or commercials, because you are telling a story, no matter what form of writing it is. So uh, there are many commonalities in all forms of writing, so I think it can all be of use to you. So why don't we jump right into the, con the conversation? So uh, I guess we should start from the beginning, and every project has to begin with a script or some sort of blueprint. So therefore, we will begin our panel by discussing writing. Now for our viewers, uh, where does someone who wants to write a script or a story begin? You know, where do ideas come from, if you guys want to take it away from there? Um, I think ideas come from other existing pieces of media, really. Not even media, just, it's funny, ideas come from ideas, I know, that sounds ridiculous. But um, I, when I was, uh, a while ago, I watched this video, I can't remember who it was by, but he was talking about how um, Jurassic Park is just theme parks and dinosaurs, and it's a fusion of two ideas, and it created a unique idea. So ideas essentially are just, mul just multiplications of this idea and this idea, and this idea, and this idea, and you put them all together, and you create a unique recipe. It's a recipe that has a bunch of different ingredients, and you just want to find those unique ingredients to create a unique story, too. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. What about you, Yogi? Um, basically what she said, yeah. Like, I think ideas are really just <clears throat> amalgamations of all these different things we see in pop culture, and we all just kind of combine it to tell our ideas or, like, the core of what we write about. Yeah, I agree. You know, uh, inspiration is always where uh, my ideas come from as well, you know, s seeing something and I want to make something like it. And so the genesis of every story is different. But for me, it usually begins with a loose idea or feeling of what story I'm going for. And so I'll be inspired by something and I have a feeling, but where do you go from there? So I'll take that big idea and a lot of the times I'll start drawing and you may invent a new character for your story by accident by doing that. It's sort of magical how it works. And so this is what I recommend if people are having trouble advancing your idea for a new story. You know, sometimes just sit down and try to come up with some characters 
And if you can't draw, then I say gather a photo collage of some actors or see if you can start putting together an imaginary cast. And, you know, you may not use every character, but it's a start. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. I, I think, like, you could even, the way I came up with a lot of things is just, like, what would be cool to draw? What do I want to draw that's cool? And I just thought, like, wolves fighting on a sea cliff, that's cool. And then that's totally. kind of like, <laughs> the plot point. Like, obviously, you don't build your plot points around just those ideas alone. But there is a start. Yeah. I love your art style, by the way. I, I, what you guys do, it's so cool, so impressive. Thank you. That's your thing. And so once you've got a basic idea of a story or character, how do you then recommend turning it into a complete idea, you know, with the beginning, middle, and end? How do you construct a solid, well-paced story? Um, How does it usually go for you guys? So for me, whenever I have a story, sometimes I take like a physical whiteboard and I start like drawing out like, okay, I want the beginning to happen here. I want the ending to happen here. And once I have like a generalized end and like a generalized um, beginning, I start trying to think about how the story is changing and how it's like this fluid living thing that's slowly learning, that's slowly growing through like interactions between characters and like the development of every character. Because I feel like all stories are going somewhere and it's our job to make sure that it gets to that destination. Yeah, I agree. That's the same thing for me. I think that's a really good way to do it is, you know, sit back and say, what is the point <laughs> of the story? You know, what is the greater purpose of the whole story? And I think that can really help you when you, you know, hit a brick wall and you have writer's block. You know, just where do you want it to go? What are you trying to say? So I agree with that point. Yeah, and... and just to add on to that, like thinking of the, st the, the story as its own character almost, like a living, breathing thing that yeah. will learn and grow and where its characters, its characters are like the organs of the story. If all of them aren't functioning correctly and they're not growing as the story progresses in some way, they can grow backwards or forwards really. They could get worse or better. Then if they're not changing in some way, then you're not really, you're flatlining. You're not having a good story. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Outlines, outlines, outlines. I always recommend. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Before I try to make a deep fleshed out form of the script or whatever I'm working on, I try to have a very decent outline. And you'll waste a lot of time, I found, if you try to write the final draft before you know exactly what the goal of your story is. And so I've just resorted to outlines until I feel confident in what I've got. And, but, you know, sometimes you can't work out certain issues in your story until you start writing it for real. And um, it's normal to constantly encounter hindrances and obstacles when you're writing. And when that happens, I recommend to step away from it and go get inspired again. You know, listen to music that stimulates your imagination. It's, it's kind of like cooking. <laughs> There's so much preparation, so many ingredients involved before you reach that final product. Um, that I agree, it's always important to find the main point of your story. And I tend to write about certain recurring themes and that can help too, just find a main theme for your story. Like for me, I like to write about, you know, the preciousness of life and characters and how they interact with each other, that sort of thing. And so the more you write, the more you find you have certain themes you enjoy writing about and you improve with every project. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. Like just finding your, your niche kind of like the themes that you write best and that uh, people enjoy the most. It's kind yeah. of fun as well. Absolutely. Uh, characters are obviously a central part of stories. They are what moves the story forward. And so uh, how do you guys typically create a character? You know, when it's time to make your cast, where do you begin? Honestly, with creating characters, I just kind of look at, like, existing ideas for characters where I'll look at, like, oh, this is this common trope for this character. I like this trope. I just want to expand on it by, like, adding maybe, like, more traits that kind of flesh it out. So, like, if it's this whole trope about someone that's super active all the time, maybe I would give them more, like, a backstory where they weren't supposed to be active or if they have some clinical in injury, which, like, prohibits them from doing that. Mm -hmm. Um. And another way that I approach it 
is like personally i don't really like fleshing out backstories as much as i do try to like look for the potential of a character and to see what direction they're going because i feel like stories aren't written to just summarize the background of a character they're more so written to explain the potential or the direction the character's heading yeah yeah coming up with characters is a lot of fun it's one of my favorite parts of the writing process I love people and I love creating characters with unique traits and stories. And my current one, my current project, Project Infinity, has a huge cast. So that was fun, you know, to juggle. But if you look at them, they're all unique. And I really tried to make them unique. And uh, some tips that I would recommend for that. Once again, I sit down and I draw characters. And you may decide to change an initial thought or idea you had for them once you can see them. I've seen and so ideas start knocking at your door once you've got a visual identity for them. You can choose what fits later. You may not use everything, but figure out their likes and dislikes. What's their favorite food? And that really helps. What family do they come from? How's their childhood? And what are their goals? I remember my English teacher a long time back told me that you should know your character so well that you can tell everyone how much change is in their pocket. Like, I feel like that's so applicable. Like, you really understand that character. Like, you can relate to them, and you can also, like, be in their shoes. I love that thought. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that what makes them, that's what makes them seem so realistic, when you can do that. And I think um, everyone has their own process. You know, we discussed recently the voiceover panel. And so that um, Tom Aglio, he voices Gun in my show, and he said he likes to choose a theme song for his characters. He's a voice actor. And um, so that's what he does. He did that for Sin and Songs of War. Um, and I know some writers literally wear a certain hat on their head to get them into a certain headspace when writing. And I just thought that was a clever idea. I heard that. And so whether you put a hat on or put some glasses on, it can help you become a character. And so, you know, you do what you got to do. Yeah, yeah. You, you do what you got to do. That, that's really, that really sums it up. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You know, something else I've learned is you can't force things on a character, if this makes sense. Like, I know it sounds weird because characters, at least in fiction, they're all made up. But somehow in this, like, unseen universe, these characters exist. And it's like they're trying to tell you who they are and, you know, little by little, you know, you develop them and get them down. And I think a key to a character being appealing and convincing is authenticity. And so I always just say, let your characters come to you and you've got to sort out what ideas don't work. You know, like I was working on a, a comic just for fun. It's nothing serious, but for a long time, I wanted this one character to have a short fuse because I thought it would be so funny for this guy to always be so together and then just turn on a dime and lose it. And I tried forcing this idea onto him for so long because I wanted it to work. But then I finally realized it simply wasn't him and it just didn't work. And it's painful to let go of ideas you really want, but you've just got to know when it doesn't work. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Not to like bring it, not to make this like an English teacher like <laughs> expose, but I had an English teacher that was like talking about, he was talking about characters and he goes, well, this guy, um, a bunch of money falls out of this truck and he could return it to who he, to the truck driver or he could keep it for himself. And he's a very like, um, he's a very patient kind of family man, very virtuous, very moral. So what would he do? I said, well, I mean, in, from a story perspective, I think he would want to keep it because that's what makes, like, that makes more conflict. That's more of a story. But he says, well, why would he keep it? He, he's a moral character. He's virtuous. So why would he keep it? So it, you kind of have to think about, like, what would my character do that aids the story, but not necessarily creates the character around the story, but the story around the character is kind of what I was trying to get at. That's a great way to put it. I know what you mean. We've talked about characters and the origins of stories. And the next step after that is putting it into action and actually the fun part a lot of the times. And so uh, that's when directing comes in, I guess you could say. And I would definitely say directors juggle many different responsibilities. So 
uh, talking to you guys, uh, what's your opinion on what is a director's job exactly? Okay, um, this is going to sound so mean, but it's it's telling people that they suck sometimes. Um, <laughs> and, and not in like, because I'm a very passive person, and not not that they suck necessarily, but that their idea doesn't like correlate with what's what's going on so we were we were doing all, me and yogi and um animators were all the animators are my friends so we we're really comfortable telling each other hey i think the chin on this character needs to be bigger he needs to look more like a jerk he, he needs to look nicer you know we're okay giving feedback so you don't have to tell people they suck necessarily you just got to give feedback to, to people and you can't be afraid to cr criticize um others uh and with and you have to praise others when they do well of course too so it's kind of that even mixture between praising people who do a great job and then giving feedback when there's something that needs to rein in or change. Yeah. Uh, what's your, um, do you have anything to add to that, Yogi? Honestly, it's just honesty is the best policy at this point. Like you can't, as well as it's great to praise someone and give them confidence, but when you're doing it in such a way that it's detrimental to their ability to like perform or help out, that's when you're failing as a director, in my opinion, so. Yeah, I agree. We have to make some tough choices sometimes, <laughs> for sure. What do you think is, like, the tough, the, what's the tough choice that you had to make with your series, sort of, like, artistically? Well, you know, uh, it all came to me. It actually took a long time to come up with my current one, like, two years of development, which is very mm -hmm. unusual for me, but I am so fortunate with Project Infinity, my cast is incredible. And so like every single take they send me is awesome. So I've been very lucky in this project to not encounter any major problems. So yeah. it's, yeah, this one has been a breeze. You know, there's some projects that are more difficult than others, but uh, Project Infinity has been a lot of fun. I'm glad to hear that, that's awesome. Yeah, and I hope the same goes for your current series. So far so good. <laughs> Well, that's good. Directors are all different. You know, some are more hands-on than others, and some do more things than others. And some of us like to do the busy work, and some of us just like to say, you know, action. <laughs> and so, uh, but we all have our own ways. You know, I personally, I like to be very hands-on. The type of work I do can be classified as animation because it's done with a sort of puppetry, but it's shot just like a live-action show. And so that means I have to design and build the sets and the costumes and edit the music and audio, all that fun stuff. But I could have other people do it, but I just enjoy having my hand in it because I have a very clear idea usually of what I want. And um, it just speeds things up for me to do it myself usually. And so, but I think a director's job is to probably effectively execute the intention of a script or just to get across the story in a cohesive and art artistic way. And they, both, they need both heart and creativity because you can always tell if the people behind the story have passion for it or if they really don't like doing it. That heart always shines through. And so I think um, it's always a plus for directors to be passionate about their work and to love what they do um, because it always shines through. Other than that, just be skilled in leading people and keeping things organized. And, you know, sometimes we've got to be the cheerleader of the project, I think, you know, the mood maker. And you, you have to be to like, sure. okay, guys, let's buckle down and do this. Like, and yeah, you do, you, I think part of your job is just cheerleading other people on, like, and trying to, like, fire up their creativity. Because a lot of the time, like, I'll, I'll be stuck. And then someone who's our colorist or something will be like, you know, you know, would be really good at this scene. And you just got to, like, you give people feedback, but you also take feedback from everyone. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about you, Yogi? Honestly, I haven't had a whole lot of experience with directing. Like, But from what I can tell right now, my main job is to just make sure that things are following some form of a vision and things are just getting done and things are just progressing overall. Yeah, especially in a field that you guys work in, like animation. You know, that's a long process. And there's a lot of technical parts to it. Yeah, it, it, it is a very long process. But uh, it, it's definitely very rewarding, though, just seeing your characters moving on screen and interacting with each other and making them feel like they're alive. 
there's a lot of fun in that. And I think, yeah, it's, it's extremely rewarding. Yeah, for sure. I'll, um, I can show the viewers, you know, just a little example of your art style. Just some previews. Sure. <laughs> yeah, like see here. This is some background art. And so, you know, a big part of directing also is the visual, like a cohesive look. And so how do you guys recommend, you know, getting the look right for a project? Because that's a really big, you know, job to handle. And so where do you guys usually begin? Yogi, do you want to take this one? Uh, Chloe, you want to take this one? I, I, I got it. <laughs> okay. So I, I kind of work more on the visuals, but Yogi kind of like, before she was on the project, when it was just in very infancy, I would send stuff to Yogi and be like, hey, Yogi, do you like this? Do you like that? And, and we would just think about what's realistic. What can we really do? Because actually these two images were two different styles that I came up mm -hmm. with. Um, they're completely different. It's the same area, though. It's the same sea, sea cave. There's a shipwreck nearby. Um, so it's the exact same area, but the atmosphere is completely different. The oh, first, I can see that. Um, yeah, the first image uh, is sort of something, the sea cave is lively, and it's it's like, fresh and beautiful and like it's new it feels like spring the second one is more of an like a winter it's cold and kind of um menacing not really menacing but it's, it's more atmospheric i guess whereas yeah. the other one is more like it's warm versus cold kind of essentially yeah. it almost kind of looks like the colorful one is like the flashback of when everything was good and then the darker one is like maybe something happened to the world or something you know there's all kinds of things you can imagine. <laughs> Shh, don't spoil. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Sorry about that. <laughs> so uh, we were choosing between these two drawing styles and I was like, I really want to go with that second one. But then I thought it took me an hour and a half to do that second one. And it took me half an hour to do the first one. So right. it's like, it's animation. So I'm going to have to draw, be drawing all the backgrounds. Almost all, I do most of the backgrounds. And then I, I'm also working on the animation. I also do the sound design, the editing. Uh, so I was just thinking, like, what would be realistic for me to juggle? And what looks good with these characters? Because if you scroll down a little bit, that's our character, Ingrid. And I just can't imagine her moving around in that second world. Because it's just so hyper-realistic and gritty. And she's kind of playful. She's kind of snooty looking. And yeah. her shape is kind of, like... Pompous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I just can't imagine her moving around that gritty, realistic, darkened world. Yeah. And so you've got to figure out, you know, what looks right, you know, the characters versus the background they're in. Do you have an, uh, it looks like you've got a background in art. I mean, you're super talented. And so did you study art or is it a hobby of yours? Um, it's just a hobby. Like I, I really enjoy art and animation, but um, I actually kind of started like in the arts as writing songs and playing music. So I write all the song, I compose all the songs for the series and do, I've been working on the soundtrack a lot mainly. But yeah, I, I really like art. I take some art courses online just for fun. That's super cool. Uh, how involved are you, Yogi, with the um, artistic uh, side of the series? Mm, not really. Personally, I'm not much of an artist. I feel like I'm much more of a writer, of an editor. I think my main job is to make sure that all of our staff is just working together. So I handle things behind the scenes, like spreadsheets or whatever just makes everything convenient. Because at the end of the day, I just want to help my friends out. So. And Yogi, like, <laughs> she does, she's saying she doesn't draw, but she draws. And, um... Her drawings are like, their style is completely different from ours. What we were going for is Disney-esque, and hers are very like comical and exaggerated. Like she had, she, she gave us this warthog, and his name is Senor Wart. <laughs> and he's just, he's got like this man fun, and he's got like a couple like moles on his face, and he's got like that almost like goatee going on. And of, of course, like, we can't use that exact design because it's a paper design, you know, it's not really like, nothing's digitized or anything. Um, but it's just like she she does have a hand. You do have a hand in the in the decision making when it comes to the characters because she always just comes up with the funniest like the the most cute like designs even though she's not an artist. <laughs> <laughs> I love your guys' uh, process. It sounds really interesting. 
Yeah, yours too. Actually, like just how it sounds like how you like how you work with the voice actors. That sounds yeah. really. It sounds like a good, healthy like process to go through. Yeah, it starts with the script, and then uh, when it's time to start filming, I usually send out the 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 scripts at the same time as filming's beginning, and little by little, it all comes together. And uh, when it comes to putting together a look for a series or a scene, you've got to consider. Um, what is happening as far as is it an emotional scene is it a happy scene because that'll change the style the lighting style do you want high contrast do you want it to be soft and uh, I've really seen in movies that it really makes a difference how a scene is lit or how it's colored and conveying you know an emotion effectively and so like there you can see it's sort of a very sterile and clean environment uh, I can't really spoil those who uh, spoil it for those who haven't seen the sh the show or the episode, but I'll just tell you something unpleasant's happening there. And uh, when you're watching it, once you hear the music and you see that sterile environment, it really helps assist the emotion of the scene. So I think that colors and lighting are very important when it comes to conveying a proper look for a series. And but you've got to make sure it all somehow. Is harmonious <laughs> as a whole yeah definitely that's like the, the the main thing that you brought up too about color color yes. is so important in animation because you're not constrained by any of like when, when you're shooting films in real life obviously you can up the contrast or like you know change certain things but then it'll look a little people know how real life looks is what yes. I'm trying to get at. Yeah. But, people, but, but animation can be anything. Like you could, you could do literally anything under the sun with animation because there's no s standard for what animation should look like. We all know what real life looks like, but animation can be anything. Yeah, I'm a huge animation fan. And so I, I just, I like to buy art books and stuff for movies. And it's amazing, you know, how, mu how many decisions go into the right colors and things like that. And so it, it's, it's a big process for sure. Do you have anything to add to that, Yogi? Um, for me personally, um, I actually have a bit of a color deficiency where I can't see certain shades if they're all in the same spectrum. Is that right? Yeah, but the thing with Chloe's art that's always really drawn me to it for like years now is that every color to me just seems so like enunciated. And like there's always that feeling of separation and I can always like understand what she's going for. So that's why I'm really hyped to be on this project. So um, I think it's important to make sure that your colors contrast enough to convey a story by themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our, um, Chloe's art style is really what jumped out to me with your guys' series as well. Um, I was just amazed. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, and it's, so, it's just so pretty to look at, you know? Yes, there's just sometimes you encounter an art style that you, you could just stare at it forever. You know, every frame you could make a painting or a picture on the wall of it. And uh, the middle ground definitely, I can tell, is going to be like that. Thank you. Um, I really hope so. Yeah. And you said you were working on the soundtrack for the series. And I think that music and sound are very important as well. You know, when you're trying to evoke a certain feeling or give an entire project a certain feeling. You know, I think we remember a lot of movies or whatever it is for the music or the sound, the, the sound design. And so do you have anything you'd like to share on that as well? Your process creating the soundtrack? I mean, I'm still pioneering for a careless whisper, but Chloe seems to be against that. So <laughs> <laughs> I, she called me and she was like, oh, I, I have such a good idea for, for I wrote this song for the intro. It's so good. And I pick up the phone, and she's playing Careless Whisper on her sax, and I just come out immediately. I was just like... <laughs> 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 but uh, for, the, for the process that we come up with, like, for... I mostly write the music by myself, but um, uh, my dad and my family, like, they're all in the movie business. Like, um, my dad worked on, like, Terminator, Star Trek, Goonies. And then my, my, my dad... Um, he does sound design. So we have all these tools at our disposal. Like I have pro tools and like a lot of, um, key, I mean, you probably seen the background, like there's keyboards. Yeah. Like, I was just looking keyboard. at that device back there. <laughs> yeah, so it's like part of a spaceship. Yeah. And I, I've played instruments since I was like four or five. So I just come up with a singular like riff or like a melody that I like. 
And a lot of the times the way I come up with it is just to create something unique. I'll usually like, I'm right-handed, so I'll pick up a left-handed guitar and start playing it as if, it, it obviously it sounds terrible for the first, like for the first hour that I'm reworking the melody, it sounds awful. <laughs> but um, it starts to come together and usually I can make something that's a little more unique and not doesn't sound too like the core progressions aren't too generic or like you know something a little different yeah I think that's really cool I love the process of music and how it assists the directing and writing process um, it's tricky you got to find what fits the mood of whatever scene you're working on <clears throat> you know I know with my projects I've got like I'll I have a folder with all the soundtrack in it and I'll like, I'll just import the song when I'm editing uh, several songs and I'll just listen and see which one fits. And, you know, sometimes none of them work and you've got to get it creative and make something else. So uh, it's tricky. That's always so frustrating when you write a whole song and then you put it in and it doesn't fit and you're like, well, I spent so many hours. How could it not be? How could it not fit? And it just doesn't. You can't use it. <laughs> But sometimes you can repurpose it, you know, I, a lot of the music that I did on previous projects, um, I would like, I would write a song and it just doesn't fit the scene and then I'll just use it like in a different scene. So it could, it might not always like work out, but a lot of the times it does. Yeah. It's never a waste of time because you can always use it in the future. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, this kind of overlaps in writing and directing, but sometimes a scene just doesn't work and it isn't working and you can't figure out what's wrong. So what are your ways that you usually go about trying to fix it or make a scene better and the best it can be? Um, me and Yogi were talking about this earlier too, where we were just like, well, how, like how do we fix scenes? Because there were a couple scenes we, we had that just didn't work, especially we had the scene like where there's a lot of exposition and I was like, well, I don't want to do an exposition dump at the beginning of the story. Like, I don't want to, like, just shove this down the reader's, I mean, the viewer's throat. Um, I want to show, not tell. Um, so what, what we kind of came up with is, like, if the scene doesn't work, what will make the audience laugh? What's funny? Because there's never anything wrong with the audience laughing. Like, that's, that's the only thing that, you, that is consistent that everyone likes is laughing. Even though people might have different senses of humor, you you just kind of got like, and even though that doesn't work sometimes, it brings us on to new ideas. So that's kind of like our process. It's a little funky, but that's what we do. Yeah, you know, everyone likes a good laugh. <laughs> so I can agree with that. Uh, do you have anything to add to that, Yogi? Yeah, honestly, that was like something we were both thinking about earlier, like Chloe said. Um, Laughter is always just something that you can always count on as like this back measure. I feel like the reason why so many like comedic shows or like little short comedic comics do so well, it's because it's just a simple way to connect with your audience. Like you don't need some super far out story to do that. Yeah, you just gotta make them laugh. That's, <laughs> that's our solution, I guess. It's a little simple. <laughs> Obviously there's a lot more that goes into it and you have to be careful where you want to use it. But it's like, if you have a serious scene and you make them laugh, then it breaks the, the tension. And if you have a funny, a scene that's already set up to be funny and you make them laugh, then that's even better. Like, it, 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 I mean, it works both ways. Yeah, for sure. And sometimes there's nothing wrong with the writing even. And it does come down to an audio or a visual thing. And so uh, there's lots of different ways to approach a scene that isn't working. And I love, I love that point. I never thought about that. You know, make them laugh. That's a, that's a really good solution. But another point on directing is a big part of the job is directing your actors, whether they're live action or voice actors. And so uh, what, what have you found is the best way to work with actors and how to get a good performance out of them? I think that's something people interested in directing probably are curious about because that's a big part of it you guys want to take it away from there <laughs> sure. uh yo you want to yeah sure <laughs> you just start um, yo you just started. yeah the uh, biggest like thing <laughs> yeah but the biggest thing that i've noticed at least is definitely from what chloe said earlier to me table reading really helps you like set up an atmosphere where people can just bounce off of each other and it just spreads this really nice vibe in this really healthy environment really agree yeah yeah, table reads are so important to 
to understanding what the, the dialogue is going to be like. And when it comes to directing the, the actors, it's just important to, to show them yourself. I'm a terrible voice actor. I'm really, really bad. Um, so I don't voice act at all. That's like the one thing that I don't stick my little toes into because just um, I just not very expressive with my voice when it's like I have to do a specific expression. But the thing is like I'll sometimes record my voice and how I want it phrased because it's hard to tell. You can't say like I want the phrase said with um, with rage. Well, is rage like seething rage where it's like quiet and like I'm going to kill you like that kind of rage or is it just roaring like just red hot anger you know there's there's so many ways to interpret these single words but you have to kind of do it yourself and then have them be interpreted their way you know i think that it helps when you're directing too even if you don't feel confident in your own abilities as an actor it at least helps to be well studied in acting i think that a good director needs to be good at acting or understanding of acting in some way uh, you can't expect to pull the right performance out of your actors if you don't even really know, you know, what you're looking for. And so if you're studied in acting and you can at least tell them what you're going for, it'll really make the job a lot easier and make it go faster. And so um, I'm kind of like you guys specifying, like I'll, at the beginning of my scripts, um, at the beginning of so many of the actor's lines, I'll have in parentheses, detailed direction like extremely worked up on the verge of tears wants to be angry but you know they're just really heartbroken you know that specific and but i've learned that it really helps especially when you can't direct them live sometimes they can't make it or they have to record alone and it really pays to have that specific instruction and i think that also helps you write characters if you understand acting and I think the, a great way to study acting is um, surrounding yourself with movies and, you know, looking at your favorite characters and studying them and seeing why you like them so much. And you start to see little patterns. It's amazing how sometimes someone will think they're a bad actor, but they can actually be really good if they're directed properly. Um, and so I think it really helps if the director understands acting because they can help actors who don't think they're very good and all they're missing is proper instruction. Yeah, there were some people who submitted on, on uh, the middle ground actually that were like, oh, well, I'm kind of embarrassed about submitting it in the place where we submit it because it's pub- like a public kind of form. It's a public channel. So they sent it to me privately and they were like, well, I want instruction first. You know, I'm kind of worried. They just expressed that they weren't super confident in their skill. And then I would listen to it and I was like, wow, you were s- so talented. And it's just, for some people, it's just a, a confidence thing, you know, and just making sure that your actors are confident in their abilities and they know how, really how talented they are is important too. Yeah, they, uh, I've seen that a lot of great actors, their biggest problem is just self-doubt. Mm-hmm. And so um, I love cheering them on and I love getting to direct actors live because they get that, you know, feedback and they, yeah. they see how good they actually are. Uh, do you have anything to add to that, Yogi? Um, yeah, I think generally most of the people that have come to our casting call thus far, it's really just a confidence thing. Like, if we just gave them a little bit more confidence or a tiny bit of guidance, like, they just blossom. And it's really cool to be a part of something like that. Yeah, for sure. It's, uh, it's you know, it's really magical to see the process and to see them, you know, all they needed was that little tip. And so that's really neat. Uh, Once all the elements of writing and directing have come together, you've gone through all the blood, sweat, and tears. Now here you are, you know, you're considering releasing it. What do you typically do to make sure everything is the best it can be, you know, before you send it out into the world, if you will? (laughs) So on previous projects, the process that we did was roast the hell out of it. Just destroy it. Like, if... I, I told um, kind of our, like, our actors, if you hated every person on this project, every person on this project bullied you in high school, then what would you say about this project? Like, what would you criticize about it? You know? <laughs> like, like yeah. just, just act like you already hate it from the get-go and then criticize the things that you don't like or you think that are out of place. And that's when you start really, like, getting into the nitty-gritty of, like, well, this seems a little bit too long and this line doesn't sound good. And you can get into the specifics of 
what what's not right with the scene or the dialogue. Yeah, that's a really good way to approach it. <laughs> what about you, Yogi? So I wasn't on Chloe's last project. However, I remember afterwards we were talking about it. And I and in hindsight, I kind of feel bad for doing this, but I remember just making fun of it like so much. Like this is so like I would be like, this scene is so boring. Nothing makes sense here. And like, I guess I'm just lucky that Chloe doesn't hold a grudge. So that's like healthy though. Like I like, <laughs> needed a lot of that just so people like a lot of the actors because they had worked on it. It's good to get eyes from outside the project and you know you would be like I don't get it I don't understand I just be like oh well that's because this and then I realized like if I have to give so much context to the scene and it can't already be expressed with the characters own emotions and their voices then I've kind of failed the scene yeah I see what you mean this is this that series uh the project you were talking about uh, yes, that's ninth horizon that's uh, my previous project which is incredible, by the way. Everyone should check it out. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my gosh, it's we've definitely improved a lot since then, though. It's it's a uh, it's been a long journey. So well, I've I've learned a lot of writing since then. I see. Yeah. Well, I love the character designs as usual. The art style is so beautiful. So I'm really looking forward to the middle ground to see where you guys are currently at. Thank you. <laughs> Sure thing. Yeah. You know, and this, this is kind of going back to our previous point, but there's just an example of the importance of lighting. <laughs> you know, the high contrast in the really dark setting, as you can see there, from my own project. So and so, awesome. yeah, well, thank you. For people who are interested in becoming writers and directors, uh, what are some avenues that they can pursue to achieve it? You know, it's kind of mind boggling for beginners. You know, where do they, where do they even start? So if you're still a student like me, there's almost always some course at your school or just like in your local area you can take like a creative writing course or like a film theory course, something that kind of immerses you into what you want to learn. If you're older and you're just looking for like a community of people to like bounce ideas with, you could always go to like your local library and see if they have like those little community clubs where you can like read scripts and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and but the major thing that the major takeaway about the whole Avenue deal is honestly, you just have to throw yourself out there. You have to try things you're not comfortable with. You have to see like what you enjoy doing, how you want to represent that core bane of your ideas. And I think a lot of time people just stick with the one thing they're good at and they never like venture into new frontiers. And I think that's what leads to projects to like a little fade down a bit. If that makes sense. Yeah, it totally makes sense. No, you're just gonna like that was kind of like what what we had with Ninth Horizon, where it was me and one of our um, the animators, Holly. We were just really used to drawing like dogs, and like like Holly's really really good at drawing dogs and four legged animals and like bears and that kind of thing. And I'm I my focus is like yeah, I like an drawing animals too, anthropomorphic animals. Um, but um, which is such a really? talent. It is the bane of my existence drawing animals. So it's a huge talent. <laughs> I love drawing people too. I love drawing like portraits and stuff. And But I love drawing animals because they're just so expressive in the, yeah, a way yeah. people aren't in a different in a different way. But um, the thing about Ninth Horizon was that I found that I, I like writing dystopia and like futuristic stuff and a mystery. And I like drawing animals. But it was so comfortable that I had so few ideas if that makes any sense i already had set up my ideas for a certain path and i just felt like the characters were part of the story instead of the story being part of the characters yeah i see what you mean and you know i think it's uh for people who are getting into it it's uh i think it's very helpful to decide what medium you want to work in because uh writing and directing you know as a whole, it's pretty expansive, but it can really narrow your search if you're like, oh, I want to do, you know, live action or animation or even comics and hosting. And it's like you guys were saying, don't be afraid to put yourself out there. And the internet is at our fingertips. And so always do some research and you can seek out opportunities. And I think that for people that you look up to who already work in the field you're interested in, try communicating and take that leap. And, um, it's just little by little you find a circle of people who do what you do and you make good friends and that's how you're that's how you learn 
And if someone else can't make it happen for you, you know, you can always do it yourself. Start a YouTube channel and start a podcast. The sky's the limit and yeah. you just got to go for it. You can't be embarrassed. That's like the number one thing because I, I know me and Yogi, like at the very beginning when we first met each other, we were embarrassed to speak to each other <laughs> in a voice call because we were just embarrassed of our voices and like now we're here and like it doesn't even I realize it doesn't even matter and some people confuse us in the voice call because our voices sound the same so like who cares it doesn't it doesn't matter no one's gonna like I mean p people might go to your podcast and nitpick and say like wow your voice is weird like but who are they to say your voice is weird your voice probably sounds just like theirs you know don't be afraid it, don't be embarrassed just to go for it mm -hmm. Yeah, what was the origin of uh, your channel or your company? Um, oh, wow. <laughs> I don't even know. I just liked animations, and I was like, okay, I'm going to make an animation channel now. And I worked on, like, a lot of animator projects, like those little, like, you know, people had, when I was younger, there were these, like, multi-animator projects for, like, um, and, and I would, like, take characters that I had written stories about. And I was really into, like, D&D &D and, like, tabletop games. And I, like Tales from the Loop, I was totally into that. Um, so I kind of just wanted to take my own characters and put them into a story of my own. Yeah, that's really cool. And, you know, I kind of, the similar idea, it just kind of hit me out of left field. I have no clue why I got the idea to sort of do this form of puppetry. But, you know, it was just like, it opened up a whole new world because especially when you work in live action, it's such a huge undertaking and managing real people like a whole cast and scheduling it's difficult but when you're animating or you're doing some form of puppetry it there's a lot more control it's in your hands and so i just took that leap and, and here i am 10 years later and so it's always interesting to hear everyone's you know origin story as i like to call it <laughs> yeah, you know cool. yeah well, I would just like to thank you so much for you guys for joining me and for everyone who is tuning into this panel. Um, it was a blast talking with uh, Chloe and Yogi about so many different things. And I feel, I feel we've offered lots of helpful tips and advice to people who are interested um, in writing and directing. I say go for it. It is so much fun. You won't regret it. <laughs> it's a blast. And, uh, but before we go, uh, why don't we tell everyone how they can keep up with us and follow the projects we're all working on. Uh, you guys can start. Um, so far, we, we have a Discord channel and uh, we posted our casting call semi-recently after we had gotten all, kind of all of our ideas together and the script together. Um, so you can find us on Instagram at tmg.animated. Um, and then um, our Discord, if you just look up the middle ground, I guess, then you'll find our casting call and there's a link to our Discord if you'd want to join and spectate. And that's pretty much it. What about you, Keiko? Uh, yeah, I say uh, my YouTube channel is the best place to follow uh, me and my work. That's where my current series, Project Infinity, is being posted. So go check it out, MLA Entertainment. And uh, I think that's about it. Sounds good. So thank you guys so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Mm -hmm.